Much obliged to you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, this is a historic debate. Historic for the people of St. Lucia, for the Parliament of St. Lucia, for the people of our Caribbean civilization, and for me personally. And I ask, Mr. Speaker, that you allow me some leeway as I share the moments of personal significance of the occurrence today. I'm aware, Mr. Speaker, that we are graced with the presence of students today. And I hope that they will have the patience to listen to this debate in its possibly its entirety. Because we are all going to be speaking to history today. And it's going to be so important that history resonates, not just in what we say, but also what we do, what we think, what we believe, what we practice. But let me return, Mr. Speaker, to the moment of personal significance of which I mentioned a few moments ago. And this is not really to blow any personal trumpet, but I am sometimes mystified by what we seem to have calmly forgotten, our history, our past, what we have achieved, what we have not achieved, what we have done, what we have not done. All seem to disappear into the night of history. I am mindful of the fact, Mr. Speaker, that this is the second amendment to the Constitution of St. Lucia since independence 44 years ago. We have had this Constitution now for, for 44 years, and this is the second amendment. As fate would have it, I featured in the very first amendment to this Constitution. An amendment to section 25, subsection A, to reduce the age of appointment to the Senate from 30 years to 21 years. And how did this happen, Mr. Speaker? When the St. Lucia Labour Party won the general elections of 1979, Mr. Speaker, And after the general elections, I was, then, I was approached by the then incoming Prime Minister, Alan Luizzi, at my house at Safi, near PI, preparing to return to the university to complete a master's degree. <coughs> so Alan said to me, we had a rough night last night. I said, how come? Well, we had a rough night because, you see, there was an issue about who should become Prime Minister. And I'm saying this publicly for the first time. I said, really, why would that happen? He said, well, you know, your good friend, George Adlam and Peter Josie, they raised the issue of who should be Prime Minister after the general election. And after much argument and debate, I was compelled to come to an agreement. And essentially, the agreement was that I would be Prime Minister for Six months thereafter, I will hand over the post to the, de de to the deceased George Adlam. That's the story. That's the real, what actually happened. There was no pre-election agreement. It happened that night. And then he said to me, but there was a happier note that all of us agreed that you should become the Minister of Education of St. Lucia. And you will do so by appointment of the Senate. By then, I had some familiarity with the Constitution and said to him, listen, I can't be a senator. I'm sorry, I can't take up the, the post. Because the Constitution says that to be a senator, to be appointed to the Senate, you have to be 30. And I am only, at the time, 28. So I couldn't be a senator. 
says, well, don't worry. We want to check the Constitution out, but we believe that we can amend it by a two-thirds majority and reduce the age from 30 to 21. I then told him, I'll give it some consideration and let him know. In the end, I accepted on the ground that I would be made a special advisor in the Ministry of Education, a de facto Minister of Education, to supervise the Ministry of Education until such time that the amendment was made. But as fate would have it, that amendment became a victim of the warfare between Odlum and Alan Louise. And I'm going to share with this house something else you don't know. But as history calls me, I answer. And I allow you to share this information because it will also help you to understand why I have been the individual that I have been as leader of the party that all of you are members of and at one time your government. In 1980, we had a common entrance examination in St. Lucia, and it fell to me as de facto minister at the time to allocate places in secondary schools. A minister whom I shall not name came to me and said, look, my son did not get the required pass mark to go to St. Mary's College, but um, you will fix up business for me and make sure that he's accepted and he enters St. Mary's College. I looked at him and said, no, I'm not doing that. I cannot do that. Because we have just introduced a new system of allocation of students to secondary schools based on the fairness of the common entrance examination. And it had to start with us. We needed to make a clear statement to the public that as ministers, we would follow the rules and disavow the perception that we're all in office for ourselves and for our benefit. The minister looked at me and said to me, well, if you're not going to allow my son to go to St. Mary's College, then when it comes to amending this constitution, you will see my position or hear my position loud and clear. Obviously, the majority then was a 12-5 in parliament so that if that minister had withdrawn his support, then the number would have been reduced to 11 and the possibility less than 11 and the amendment would not have carried. I stood my ground. The Prime Minister came to me and said, but that's a minor matter, why don't you? I said, Sir Alan, you're a former just judge. You need to support me. I can't do this. I'm not doing it. You can have the post and I'll go about my business. He said to me, there's no need for that, no need for that. As fate again would have it, we had this devastating hurricane. This matter was deferred and it dragged and dragged. I resigned the first time. And then eventually, they decided to go through with the amendment to the Constitution. But by then, I was 30 and there was no need for the amendment to be done for my benefit. In reality, the amendment was done for the incoming generation. That is the story behind why you had that first amendment to the Constitution. And the age was reduced to 21. Of course, if I had my way, that age would have been reduced to 18 years. So that was the first episode. Then, In this instance before us today with the Caribbean Court of Justice. You will note that the member for Castries East in his presentation referred to the fact that the agreement was signed in 2001. That tells you something. Because between 1996 and 1997, I served as general counsel at the CARICOM Secretariat and had the responsibility to begin the process of preparing the draft for the agreement that was signed. In fact, that draft agreement was prepared by Duke Pollard, who subsequently became a judge of the Caribbean Court of Justice. 
but it was my responsibility. I saw to that first draft, to that initial draft of what we eventually signed. I have therefore always been part of the thinking, part of the fiber, what makes the Caribbean Court of Justice. And today you're asking me to come to this house and want to and suggest that I should oppose the accession to the Caribbean Court of Justice on the grounds that you need a referendum. When I was one of those who was an author and part and parcel of that agreement that created that court. Oh, could you have the temerity to come to me with that kind of message? And of course, when I had the honor to be the Prime Minister of this country in 1997, CARICOM assigned the responsibility for justice and governance to me so I then had the responsibility to secure agreement to establish the Caribbean Court of Justice to persuade my colleagues to persuade the member states of CARICOM to establish the Caribbean Court of Justice and bring it to life. That's another story, that's another episode. I don't even know if people understand why the Caribbean Court of Justice was ever established in Trinidad and Tobago when Trinidad and Tobago is not a signatory to the appellate jurisdiction of the court. Very simple. The then Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago suggested, that, suggested to his colleagues with my support that we should allow Trinidad and Tobago to establish the court in Trinidad and Tobago if only it would help to persuade those persons in Trinidad who oppose the Caribbean Court of Justice that Trinidad and Tobago would have a valid stake in that court by the fact that the, the presence of the court was in Trinidad and Tobago. That's the story why it's there in Trinidad and Tobago. And we bought the, we bought the argument. So that's the story of <coughs> of that court. As you may have heard, the Caribbean Court of Justice was formally inaugurated in Port of Spain on April 16, 2005. And there I had the opportunity to deliver an address as the Prime Minister with responsibility for governance of justice, which I did on the theme, quote, leap of enlightenment. But here in St. Lucia, we lost the momentum to establish the court. We lost the general election in 2006. And following our return in 2011, we resumed the efforts to establish the court. At the time, and as you know today, we needed a two-thirds majority to amend the Constitution, but we had an 11-seat majority. It was 11 seats to six which, if you translated it into two-thirds, would have been roughly 11.33. And if you notice, the member for Castries North is looking at me very closely because he's wondering, when am I going to get to him? Yes, I'm going to get to him now. <laughs> for safety's sake, we determined that it was not wise to proceed with on the basis of an 11-6 majority, but to go on a majority of 12-5 because given that the two-thirds was 11.33, we did not want that to be an issue to be litigated in the courts of what really constituted a minor thing like a two-thirds majority. So we played it safe. And we wanted to put the issue beyond doubt. I then engaged the member for Castries North, and at the time he was the leader of the opposition. We had private discussions on the matter. I reminded him of the position of the founder of the United Workers Party, Sir John Compton, and former member of this house, who in his public pronouncements had repeatedly said that he supported the Caribbean Court of Justice. 
But then, unfortunately, a new leader was elected for the United Workers' Party and the honorable member was exiled to the back benches. He was exiled to the back benches and uh, the new leader of the United Workers' Party made the position absolutely clear. And of course, that new leader was the member for Miku South. Faced with that issue, we then had to contend with the other issue as to whether there was any veracity in the common view that we needed a referendum. And at that stage, we decided that a better approach would be to ask the uh, Court of Appeal for an advisory opinion on whether St. Lucia needed a referendum. The court confirmed there was no requirement for a referendum, and I will certainly want to go through that issue in a few moments. Armed with the advisory opinion of the court, we wrote to the British government whose agreement was required, as explained to you by the Prime Minister and a member for Castries East. An amending bill was drafted, did its first reading in Parliament, but at last we did not complete the process as the general elections of 2016 intervened. Now, the honor of completing this process of accession belongs to the member for Castries East, who achieved this remarkable majority at the general election of 2021. And it is this remarkable majority that has given us the key to unlock that door to ensure that we can complete that parliamentary process. So today, Mr. Speaker, I do not speak to the assembled parliamentarians. I know they can listen if they wish to, but I'm not going to speak to them. I am sorry, I, am also, I also did not intend to speak to the opposition, <laughs> but I hope even if they were there, they might have cast their air and maybe picked up one or two things that they could have understood, but I would not have been speaking to them because I know what the position is. Rather, Mr. Speaker, I want to speak to the people of St. Lucia. I want to ask them to give me a listening ear. I want to ask them to give me a moment of constitutional, constitutional and possibly ideological indulgence. A little bit. I'm getting on in age. I'm entitled to it, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I ask them to allow me to persuade them that our accession to the Caribbean Court of Justice is indeed a leap of enlightenment. Just give me a few moments to explain why I believe it is so important that we take that step and why I support the initiative to do so. In that effort, I want to do a couple of things. I want to share a little bit of the history of the Caribbean Court of Justice, a little bit of the past. I want, in different terms than that of the member for Castries East, to answer the question, do we need a referendum? Is the opposition correct or simply mischievous and opportunistic that it should call for a referendum? And then I want to return to a theme again addressed by the member for Castries East, the issue of expanding access to justice. Then I want also to touch on the issue of whether the Caribbean Court of Justice is truly an independent court, again touching on his point, but in my own style perhaps addressing it in a different way. And I also want to address this issue of reforms to the judiciary and to handle or touch the argument that is posited 
that you should fix up the whole judiciary before you accede to the jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice. I want to touch on that. Because those who make that proposal, I want to ask them, why is it from our colonial days to the days of our independence and now 44 years after, the Privy Council has never been able to bring any reform to the judicial system of the Caribbean. Why? What's the issue? Now, Mr. Speaker, to some extent, I have to accept that this debate is misplaced. And I want you to forgive me and listen to me carefully why I say this. Those of us who have engaged in this debate over the years, Mr. Speaker, often speak about accession in philosophical and ideological terms. We say, for example, that accession will complete our circle of independence. It will complete the repatriation of our constitution, meaning that this constitution will come back to us. It will be part of our grand norm. We created it. It's ours. Those who see it that way. And then, of course, there are those who say that if we do this, it will affirm and express our identity as a people and civilization. And it is part of that unfolding process. I have come to accept, Mr. Speaker, that while these principles are sacred to some of us, sacrosanct to some of us, these principles mean little or nothing to the citizens of our region. They are not preoccupied with issues of completing the circle of our independence, or, even though it matters so much. It matters to people like me. It matters to judicial personnel. It matters to academics. It, 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 it matters who have a sense of what the Caribbean civilization should be. It matters, but the rank and file for them it is of little significance. Our people seem to me to be preoccupied with the issue of access to justice, to the quality of justice, justice that is delivered by judges who are fair, independent, impartial, and clothed in integrity. That's what they seem to be preoccupied with. You know what solutions are preoccupied with, Mr. Speaker? They are occupied with what is happening in our magistrates' courts. And I am not saying anything out of turn when I say, Mr. Speaker, that St. Lucians who are listening to me and listening to the rest of you, they're going to be, they're going to be preoccupied with why our courthouses say in you fought have been closed for months. The magistrates' courts have been closed for months. And you can't be talking about access to justice in these matters if we don't resolve those issues. Because this is where, Mr. Speaker, that a lot of the justice that we speak of takes place. And we have not grasped the importance and significance of that first rung of the judicial ladder, the magistracy. These are the things our people are concerned about. The quality of justice, access to, accessing justice, whether our judges are independent, whether they, they, they're impartial, whether they're delivered quality to them. They're not interested in the philosophical and, and the philosophical and ideological issues, sad to say. But we are because it means my generation. It means a lot. You see, we came out, we came out of a certain kind of social matrix. We were the children of the black power movement, of black nationalism. That's where we came from. We knew what the value of an Afro was and what statement it made and what it meant. We knew all those things. And for us, it is a completion of that journey of self-identity. So for us, it's a big issue. But unfortunately, for the majority of people, they don't see it that way. Theirs is more immediate. Theirs is more immediate. And I believe that part of the problem with the CCJ has been that the debate has been misplaced. We did not explain enough to the people of our region, to the people of St. Lucia, how this court, by its establishment, will change the issue of access to justice, the quality 
of justice and will make a difference in their lives. That it is not just a question of having judges, but it is also a question of having judges who understand our region, who understand the culture of the region, who understand the people of the region, who understand what it means when somebody takes a house, builds a house on government lands, because they have nowhere else to turn and the court says well you did so but let us look at what you did against the rights that you may have had and of course the rights of the owner of the land crown but who understand why this is happening i'm not going to quote babylon verse of famous cases to you this is not the day for that and by the way mr speaker let me warn you don't even bother look at that clock because you see, today I probably will likely speak more than an hour. I believe I've earned it, eh, Mr. Speaker? All right. Now, so Mr. Speaker, we focused on the lofty ideas regarding the establishment of the court, but not the things people are concerned with. And in this debate, this is where we have to go to share with them those concerns. Having said this, I want to very quickly, Mr. Speaker, touch a little bit of the history of the court. The first thing I want the people of St. Lucia to know and to understand is, look, the idea of a Caribbean court to replace the Caribbean court of, to replace the Privy Council is nothing new. In fact, it has been in existence for over 122 years. It was an idea whose seed was planted 122 years and possibly more. There's nothing new. This was not something that Caribbean government rushed into because it was fashionable. We knew from judicial practice that we had to take that leap of faith at some point. So, when you go back into our historical times, ironically, the idea first emerged in Jamaica when the Gleaner newspaper mentioned in 1901 that thinking men believe that the Judicial Committee has served its turn and is now out of joint with the condition of the times. That was said in 1901. In 1901. And do you know that the language that the Gleaner newspaper used, you would think that it is the language that would be said today because it resonates. They said, thinking men believe that the Judicial Committee has served its turn and is now out of joint with the conditions of the times. And this is really what you're saying. The Privy Council is out of joint with the conditions of the times. We have grown up. We are mature people. We are confident civilization. We have learned to manage our affairs. We have learned to make our mistakes and correct our mistakes. What more do you want of a civilization? Then, Mr. Speaker, we might want to say that sometime in 1970 the efforts to establish such a court assumed new momentum but the most significant development occurred in 1972 when the organization of commonwealth caribbean bar associations ogba established a committee to examine the issue of creating a caribbean court of appeal to replace the privy council And then, of course, that report was prepared by the esteemed jurist, the first principal of the Norman Manley Law School, Aubrey Fraser, advocating for the replacement of the Judicial Council with an indigenous regional court. The next important step was, in fact, in 1989, when the idea became more firmly rooted 
coming out of the Grand Anne's Declaration of 1989, which established what became known as the Ramphal Commission. And then when that commission reported in 1992, they said in their famous report, Time for Action, quote, the case for a CARICOM Supreme Court with both a general appellate jurisdiction and an original one is now overwhelming indeed. It is fundamental to the process of integration. And that's, apart from history, the second most powerful reason that if we wanted to support Caribbean integration, then we had to establish a regional court to underpin the existence of integration. And as you can see, the benefits have already begun to flow. From then, it was a matter of giving the direction of which I spoke. 1992, report took its stand to be circulated, to be shared. 1996-97, of my own arrival at the CARICOM Secretariat, and the finalization of the preliminary draft of this, of this agreement, this international agreement, this treaty to establish the court. And that is a synopsis. There is so much more now. You will understand, therefore, why I say to you today that for me this has a lot of personal significance. I'm going to bet you, Mr. Speaker, that most of them are on this table they're not aware of the history that I speak. They may have sat around the table and made decisions, but they're not aware of that history. They're not even aware how intimately I was involved in that process. Well, don't forget, well, don't forget the people's solution. And so, if I speak in emotive terms, if I speak with renewed vigor and spirit, it is only because as I prepare to signal my departure at the appropriate time, I am dealing with an issue that resonates with me, an issue of immense personal significance. I don't know, Mr. Speaker, and the member for Castro Z said it, I don't know why we doubt ourselves. I don't know why we doubt our abilities, our intellect, our competence and brilliance. I don't know why we want to teach the children who are here, the students who are here today, that we are not some of the brightest people around in this world. I don't know why in the region we have this tension, this capacity to devalue ourselves. You can't tell me anybody from Oxford is better than me. I'm as good as any one of them. Any one of them, anywhere. We have to stop this nonsense. We have to stop this nonsense. And it is not a statement of my bigotry that I'm as good. I'm only pointing out that we have to stop it. And we need to understand that we are a special people in our region. We, are gift. we have gifts. We must celebrate what we have. And I'm going to come to that in a few minutes. You know, recently I, I had the unfortunate um, moment to read that Peter Minchel was dead. Which wasn't true, it was actually fake news. Real fake news and P Peter Minchel quickly came out and said that's not so, but you know, forget for a moment our Derek Walker and Sir Arthur Lewis and you heard the brilliant lecture delivered by the Pro Vice Chancellor of um, the University of the West Indies. It's not everything he said I agree with, by the way, I have my differences with what he says, but and his interpretation of certain things, there will always be differences. Yeah. But, 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 he was uh, making the point of that very special place that we, we, we have um, in the region. And we doubt ourselves because we don't appreciate and we don't know what we have created. And I'm going to remind, because the, 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 the Prime Minister, the member for Castro, he's touched on it, but we need to be remind ourselves of some of the accomplishments that we have had because, you see, we, we lawyers, we don't have a way we celebrate what we do, you know. We celebrate what we do by the cases we win in court and whether we get a good judgment or bad judgment, but sometimes we don't fully appreciate what we had. I had to remind a member for Castro when he mentioned um, Sir Danny Alexander, 
that he was the first chief justice of an independent Nigeria. He was a seclusion. And you know where he came from? He came from Soufre. That's where he came from. That's where he came from. When the African countries wanted persons to head their judiciaries, they turned to Caribbean lawyers to head their judiciary and to guide them in their post-independence period. Caribbean lawyers filled the office of Chief Justice of Kenya, of Nigeria, and of Zimbabwe. I spoke of Sadani, but of course, but the brilliant Telford Georges, my dear friend Telford Georges, who when he left the Court of Appeal in Trinidad and Tobago, found himself in Africa to be Chief Justice. Indeed, the leaders of the bar in this region have long been the professionals of choice throughout the Caribbean, as of course they continue to be. And West Indian lawyers have held some of the highest judicial offices in the world. We provided a judge to the world's most senior judicial body, the International Court of Justice in The Hague. A Caribbean national was there. A West Indian lawyer was chairman of the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea in Hamburg. Our region provided judges to the Yugoslav and Rwanda War Crimes Tribunal. Our venerable former Chief Justice and former President of the Caribbean Court of Justice, Sir Dennis Barron, was head of that tribunal in Rwanda. We have held the chairmanship of the Inter-American Judicial Tribunal. <clears throat> and now we have the distinction of providing one of the first judges of the International Criminal Court. Uh, let me tell you, we have a habit when we're evaluating Derek Walker. We say we have the highest per capita of um, Nobel Prize winners in our country. But let me tell you something, you don't know. In per capita terms, I doubt if any other community in the world has served the world's wide cause of justice more comprehensively and more consistently than the Caribbean. I doubt it. No civilization has had so much influence on the dispensation of justice in the world than Caribbean jurists and Caribbean lawyers. I stand by that. I stand by it. Don't come and tell me about Privy Council was to be final appellate court. That was under jurists. Oh, it's under duress. The Privy Council operated under the umbrella of colonialism. They were an instrument of colonialism. They implemented the colonial agenda. And I'm going to digress and I'm going to cause a little bit of offense too. Because make no mistake that that Privy Council is about implementing the imperial agenda and the ideological agenda of the British government, you know. Make no mistake about that, you know. You know why hanging is a problem in the Caribbean? Hanging is an issue in the Caribbean. Every opportunity that the Privy Council gets to repudiate a hanging in the Caribbean, a sentence of hanging, it takes that opportunity and finds some reason to overturn the judgment of a Caribbean court. Why? Because the British government has taken an ideological position that hanging will no longer be tolerated and the Privy Council has been its instrument to implement that philosophy. Now, this is where I disagree with the judges in the Caribbean. Because they allow themselves to be blinded by something called, we lawyers call precedent and apply the precedents created by the Privy Council. But the president, the reasoning of the Privy Council in those cases is nothing more than ideological. It is implementing the agenda of the Europeans and of the British. That's what it is. That is what it has been all along, all along. But we refuse to call a spade a spade. That's in our nature. We recoil. And when I stand in this house and I say, oh, I'm going to call as you, I don't care if you like me or not, I'm going to call a spade a spade. That's the kind of thing that I mean. That's calling, that's calling a spade a spade. 
So, Mr. Speaker, let us be very clear ourselves. There's no need to doubt ourselves, Mr. Speaker. Against that background, Mr. Speaker, I now want to come to this referendum question um, and ask whether we need a referendum. Do we need a referendum? No, it sounds good, doesn't it? Member for Castries, he said it well, it sounds good. Consult the people. You go and consult the people, hear their views, you have a referendum. Consult the people, you are acceding to democracy. So I want to ask, if that is the case, why then you have created a constitution that allows you to amend some sections in your constitution by a specified majority, whether it's two thirds or three quarters, but yet in some of those sections you say that you must go to the people of the country and get a um, secure referendum and not just a referendum but a specified percentage of votes before you can amend this constitution. It is clear that the, our constitution, our, the framers of our constitution understood that there were some provisions in this constitution that did not need a referendum but there are others because of their importance their significance, it had to go to the people to make a final decision. That's the nature of the constitution we have. The tragedy is that very few provisions in this constitution can be amended by a two-thirds majority as we are doing today. The vast majority require significant engagement of the public. So this constitution actually ensures that people are part of the lawmaking process when it comes to amending our constitution. That's what we have. And by the way, for those of you who are Anglophiles, by the way, that's not what the British constitution says. The British constitution hardly know about the thing called referendum, you know. It's not enshrined, nothing is enshrined enshrined in the British Constitution, although you might want to argue that the Bill of Rights, the UK Bill of Rights is somewhat entrenched. They don't have a written, con they don't have a written constitution, you know. But you know what? They put us through all of this because they felt that we can't handle ourselves, we couldn't trust ourselves. That's the bottom line, you know. And you're so faithful to the untruth that the British bequeath us that you yourselves believe in it too. Now you must trust yourself, you better go and trust the Englishman. That's where we are. That's the reality that we have. That's the reality that, that, that we have. But Mr. Speaker, every government in the Caribbean that has had a referendum in obedience to their constitution has run into trouble. Oh. Everyone, Antigua got into trouble. Grenada got into trouble. St. Vincent got into trouble. And the Bahamas got into trouble. Let me tell you how perverse it, it was in the Bahamas. Do you know, Mr. Speaker, that in the Bahamas, the Bahamian man can marry an outsider. And that outsider is entitled to citizenship under the Bahamian constitution. The Bahamian woman, on the other hand, if she marries a man from outside, now you understand why the Bahamian women don't like to marry people from the rest of the region. If she marries a man from outside, that man is not entitled to citizenship. You understand what I'm saying? Now, a very patriotic, bright, sharp prime minister, a dear friend of mine, decided that couldn't be right. And since we were, they were in the era of clamoring for the rights of women, he will go to the electorate, he'll propose an amendment to the Bahamian constitution and ask the Bahamian people to vote in a referendum as prescribed by the constitution to make it, to equalize the, re, the treatment of women in the Bahamian constitution to give women the same rights that men in the Bahamas have. You know what happened when he went to the constitution? He lost, the con he lost it. You would not imagine that the people of the Bahamas so enlightened that in this day and age they get an opportunity to amend the constitution to treat women equally like men. And they turn it down. And you must have had women in the Bahamas who also turn it down. 
And you know why? Because they became the victim of the ignorance of the politics that we have. Because instead of voting on the virtues and benefits of the referendum, what they went to do was to vote against the government because they don't like the government. That's what has happened in all of these islands. And unless, mark my words, unless you do not get agreement between an opposition and a government to amend those deeply entrenched provisions in this constitution, we're not going to get anywhere. I mean, there was one country, and there are some countries who have life easier. Barbados can amend its constitution easily. They don't have no referenda requirements. Trinidad is another that can amend its constitution fairly easy. In Jamaica, they amended their Bill of Rights and created a new Bill of Rights, patterning it against the Bill of Rights in Canada because, because their constitution was, no, was much more facilitated. That's the reason why. So referenda are not tools to play with. What the opposition really wants is to go for a referendum, waste a pile of money going up and down the country shouting and screaming, talk, you know, and talking about the usual things. That's what they want, you know. It's political embarrassment and political mischief because they feel if they go for a referendum, they, it's, a, it's really a vote they want. It's, they want to see what the chronometer is saying about the government. Etc. That's really what they want to cause mischief. But you know what? You, you cannot, on the one hand, claim that you are faithful to the Constitution, you respect the Constitution, and then, on the other hand, what you are doing effectively is to try to denature the Constitution, violate the very same Constitution, by imposing a requirement which the Constitution does not impose. That's what you are doing. You have no respect for the Constitution. If you can't appoint a Deputy Speaker for five years, how can you come to me and claim you are respecting the Constitution? You want referendum. How can you do that? And why should anybody believe you? Why should anybody believe you? You create a precedent. And there's one lesson I have learned as Prime Minister. Succeeding Prime Ministers better understand this. Let me tell you something. A constitution can never be a complete document. It can never anticipate all the problems you will have. A constitution is just bones. Some have more bones than others because they are more detailed. You will meet situations in public life that you never dreamed of or you never thought possible. And the constitution will have no answers. But you know what? You know how we deal with it? As our society develops, as we become more sophisticated, as our politics evolves, we try to create certain conventions and practices to fill in the gaps. We are a young nation, 44 years old. I was around when independence occurred in 79. I was around. We are a young nation. We are hard on ourselves. We don't understand that we are evolving. We will not get it right all the time. We will make mistakes. But we can't afford to be as hard on ourselves because say what they, what they will, we have been able to govern and manage ourselves notwithstanding all the problems we have had. We have done it. We have done it. Yes, we have problems, we have issues. But one thing I've learned is this. When I look back at the last couple of years and what happened with the tenure of the last government, what are you going to do Parliament in the past, Mr. Speaker? And I notice I haven't called your name for a while, Mr. Speaker. When we introduced legislation, sometimes I acted in the belief, which turned out to be wrong and naive, that my successor would understand why certain legislative postures were adopted, and that in turn, having come to power, will respect what was created and applied. Whether we want to admit it or not, that was an important lesson from the tenure of John Compton, Sir John Compton. And it, he applied it in the context of the Deputy Speaker. 
When you see the Labour Party agreed after the debacle of 79, after they were almost annihilated politically, to accept the deputy speaker position, in those days it was understood between the two that it was an agreement between the parties. When we lost the general election of 2006, he sent the member for Castries notes to me and asked me whether I would accept or would agree to one of my members being deputy speaker and I told him I will have none of it. <laughs> Why? Because in the face of that victory I needed to protect my six members to be sure that we can deliver the punches we needed to deliver. But you know what he did? He promptly resolved it by appointing one of his elected members as deputy speaker. And that didn't stop the relationship talking to each other. Never did. Because you see, you act on the basis that there are conventions that fill in gaps in your political practice and so you're going to rely on those conventions. Now I had expected that the honorable member for Miku South would have understood that and would have dealt with the um, deputy speaker situation because, you know why? You know why? Because it is important for the people of the country to see that you are being faithful to the constitution which they accepted should govern them. That's why you do those things. It doesn't have political benefits like it will necessarily when you vote but what it does, it maintains the sanctity of your fundamental document. The document you say that governs your life. That's what it is. But I'm happy that there will be an amendment and I would want to give meaning to this when it is convenient at that time. So, We now come to this matter of this referendum. Member for Viewfort South, you have 10 minutes left. No, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm certain that our members would agree that I deserve an hour and possibly more, but I'll take an hour. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Member for Henry North. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, permit me to invoke 4210 in the standing orders to allow the Honorable Member for Viewfort South an additional 30 minutes within which to complete this no, no, presentation. No, no. Oh. You want to? You want Okay, Mr. Speaker, correction. Um, permit me to suspend 328 to allow the parliamentary representative for the Fort South an additional hour within which to complete his presentation on the bill before the House. Honourable members, the question is that standing order 328 be suspended to allow the member for View Fort South an additional 60 minutes in which to complete his presentation. And I'll put a question, as many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. Leave is granted, proceed member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, thank you very, very much. I'm sorry I had to extract that from the member for <laughs> Denry North, but never mind, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the question, do we need a re referendum? As I said earlier, this matter has bedeviled our efforts and the government which I led out of deference to the minority who insisted decided to put the matter to the court, albeit for an advisory opinion. And we know that an advisory opinion is not a binding decision of the court. It is not the process of, of, of um, litigation before the court. It only offers an indication of how a court is likely to rule. And I really want to commend to everybody in this house to read the advisory opinion of the Court of Appeal. But I want to start by saying to the people of St. Lucia that as much as we may criticize the framers of our Constitution, nevertheless, nevertheless, it was very clear that the framers of our Constitution knew that the time would come when we would have when we would have had to sever links to the Privy Council. They knew that. 
And they reflected it in this document. And I want you to look at a particular section we'll be talking about, section 41.7, subsection A. Now, just, just, just look at it for a minute. 41. Right. First, in section 46, it says how you must amend the Constitution for those deeply entrenched provisions, the ones where you require like a three quarters majority and a referendum. It says that you must have those specified majorities and you will have to have a referendum if you touch those sections. Like for example, the sections dealing with your fundamental rights, freedom of association, freedom of expression, etc. Then it goes on to say, in subsection seven, the provision of paragraph B of subsection 6 of this section shall not apply in relation to any bill to alter. It is saying that the provision to have specified majorities to alter or change the deeply entrenched provisions of the Constitution, like the establishment of courts, your fundamental rights, etc., establishment of the House of Assembly, etc., and you require specified majorities and referendum. But in this instance specified under 41.7, you do not need that. It says, the provisions of paragraph B of section 6 of this section shall not apply in relation to any bill to order. And it says, section 107 of the Constitution, in order to give effect to any agreement between St. Lucia and the United Kingdom concerning appeals from any court having jurisdiction in St. Lucia to Her Majesty in Council. What on earth does it mean? It simply means, it simply means that this requirement for you to have a specified majority and to have a referendum for the deeply entrenched provisions of the Constitution does not apply in the case where you have an agreement with the British government and you enter into an international agreement and of course where you deal with the matter of appeals to Her Majesty in Council, the Privy Council. It says, I'm going to repeat it. Section 107 of this Constitution, in order to give effect to any agreement between St. Lucia and the United Kingdom concerning appeals from any court having jurisdiction in St. Lucia to Her Majesty in Council, so you don't need to satisfy those earlier requirements about referenda, about specified majority, if you are dealing with an agreement regarding those appeals that go to the Privy Council, Her Majesty in Council. So what referendum are you talking to me about? When you established the Caribbean Court of Justice, it was an agreement. It was an international agreement. Why do you have to write to Her Majesty's government? Well, it's not Her Majesty, it's the King's government these days. Why do you have to write to the King's government about your decision to amend your constitution? Because it is in fulfillment of that requirement that you have entered into an agreement, an international agreement, a treaty, and you are saying to the King's government, we are ready to proceed and we need your concurrence. And of course, the member for Castries East gave you the response of the British government. So the framers were clear, they understood. But you know what I find particularly fascinating, Mr. Speaker? Uh, Mr. Speaker, look at it. Look at it again. You know what I find fascinating, Mr. Speaker? I tell you. Somehow, somebody knew and understood that somewhere in time, in history, that it it may be possible to secure an agreement between CARICOM governments, governments in the region. You understand, Mr. Speaker, to establish a court to replace the Privy Council. I am certain that is what at the back of their minds. Now, but then, clear as this is, you still have problems. So we go to the advisory opinion, and uh, then, of course, that section 41, which is a big issue, and I have referred to. 
when the talk of acceding to the Caribbean Court of Justice came around, obviously we looked at all the Caribbean constitutions to see what they had. The OECS constitutions, Dominica, Grenada, St. Kitts, etc. And then we noticed that the Commonwealth of Dominica had proceeded to the Caribbean Court of Justice and its constitution had a nearly similar provision to ours. So the question arose, why Dominica and not St. Lucia if the provisions in law we say are in pari materia are almost identical, but why them and not us? Now just to explain to you, I'm going to read the Dominica provision and read the St. Lucia provision so you can understand this thing a little better. Don't let them bamboozle you, there's no need to be bamboozled. Don't let them bamboozle you. Now, St. Lucia first. St. Lucia 41, section 41, subsection 7, subsection 8. The provisions of paragraph B of subsection 6 of this section shall not apply in relation to any bill to alter. A. Section 107 of this constitution in order to give effect to any agreement between St. Lucia and the United Kingdom concerning appeals from any court having jurisdiction in St. Lucia to Her Majesty Council. This is St. Lucia. Dominica now. And I'm looking at Dominica section 42, subsection 4A. That's the equivalent. It says, the provisions of this of paragraph B of this of subsection 3 of this section shall not apply in relation to any bill to alter A. Section 106 of this constitution in order to give effect to any agreement between Dominica and the United Kingdom concerning appeals from any court having jurisdiction in Dominica to the Judicial Committee. Now, if my students were sitting in the, out there sharp enough, um, uh, sharp enough, they might pick up, they might pick up the little difference Although they might need the aid of the country, the difference is this. The section in the Dominica Constitution to which reference is made, that section 106 of the Constitution of Dominica is not the same section that the Constitution of St. Lucia refers to. Section 106 of the Constitution of Dominica is referring to appeals from the Court of Appeal to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. So in the Dominica case, the reference section was to appeals to the Privy Council, so the Dominica Constitution made it absolutely clear that the agreement you are talking about has to be in the context of dealing with the issue of appeal to the Privy Council. That's the first limb. Don't let them bamboozle you, I tell you. Now, said Lucian, what was the problem? Let's go back. St. Lucia says, the provisions of paragraph B of subsection 6 of this section shall not be applied in relation to any bill to alter section 107 of this constitution in order to give effect to any agreement between St. Lucia and the United Kingdom concerning appeals from any court having jurisdiction in St. Lucia to Her Majesty in Council. Now when you take the St. Lucia constitution and we now go to section 107 listen to what section 107 says and this is where the problem lies. And this is where the problem lies. Section 107 says, subject to the provisions of section 39.8 of this constitution, an appeal shall lie from decisions of the high court to the court of appeal as of right in the following cases. Final decisions in any civil or criminal proceedings on questions as to the interpretation of this constitution. Final decisions given in exercise of the jurisdiction conferred on the High Court by Section 16 of this Constitution, which relates to the enforcement of the fundamental rights of the and such other cases as may be prescribed by Parliament. In other words, 
The section in Dominica is directing us to where the agreement should be with the Majesty to the link. That is to the Privy Council. In our case, it is directing us to the decisions of the Court of Appeal. But who wants to change the structure of a Court of Appeal, a structure that is entrenched by agreement? You can't do that. Yes, Parliament can prescribe, um, can um, certainly pr um, prescribe establishment of courts. So the question then became that if there is a variation in that the reference in St. Lucia was different from Dominica, then was there an error? Now, you know us in the region. You know us in the region? White men can't make mistakes, you know. I'm sorry for sounding that way. But we believe because, you see, these white men in England, they would draft this constitution and so on. They tell you I'm outrageous, I'm being racist. You know me already, they always say, you talk about my father, all kind of nonsense. But be that as big. If, the, since this constitution is drafted, was drafted by the colonial office, mind you, with the input of local politicians, they will tell you, them fellas in England can't make mistakes. The mistake is ours, we are the ones who make the mistake. That's them. That's them. But the reality is that it was a mistake because there's one other constitution like it which is similarly worded and that is the constitution of the Federation of St. Christopher and Nevis and the reference which I shall not bother to go through with you today, the reference in this constitution, despite the differences, the reference is identical to the Dominica constitution. And the court said they are fortified in their view that it was a mistake in the case of the constitution of St. So the question to be settled in St. Lucia, and that is why we need to have respect for the decision of the court. The question is whether there was a mistake in the Constitution, and I'm now going to turn to the judgment of the court very briefly. In the majority opinion of the, the court, and they put that question very well. In fact, I'm going to read it out. I'm going to read it out to you. The question was whether the reference in section 41, sec subsection 7A of the Constitution, should properly be to section 108 instead of section 107. And section 108 is what governs appeals to the Privy Council. If yes, was the reference to 107 an error? And the Chief Justice again put it differently. The question may essentially be stated thus. Is the reference to section 107 in section 417A of the Constitution instead of 108 an error? That is a typographical or printing error which would be correct, which should be corrected? Or does the section read as the framers of the Constitution intended it? That's how the Chief Justice put it. Now, we decided, as I said earlier, to refer the matter for an advisory opinion. And I want to just remind the public of who appeared before the court. <coughs> it says Queen's Council appeared on behalf of some members of the St. Lucia Bar Association who put forward a legal opinion given by Dr. Lloyd Barnett, prepared at the request of the St. Lucia Bar Association. Council on behalf of the other members of the St. Lucia Bar Association. Council on behalf of the leader of the opposition in St. Lucia. So you see, the leader of the opposition at the time was, was represented. Huh? Also present at the hearing was Mr. Richard Williams, attorney at law, attending the proceedings on behalf of the Attorney General of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, whose constitution is said to contain a similar reference as section 47A of the St. Lucia Constitution. Now, there's a story about Lloyd Barnett, the eminent Caribbean jurist, because <laughs> the Bar Association had engaged Lloyd Barnett to give an opinion as to whether there was error. Lloyd Barnett is famous, he's distinguished. He wrote one of the first constitutional treaties of Caribbean constitutions, the Constitution of Jamaica. And he has an incredible history in the courts of Jamaica. Do you know Lloyd Barnett told the, told the Bar Association that he agrees that there was an error in, in the Constitution? 
distinguished counsel, you know. Told the very persons who recruited him to go and argue for them that he told them there was an error. And the judge makes reference to this, um, to this subsequently. Now, the court concluded in really poignant language that there was an error in our constitution. And this is what the Chief Justice said in paragraph 27. And I want to read it to you to put it on the record because this, this debate is too important not to read those things into, into the record. And we need to do so today. This is what the judge said. The provisions of the Supreme Court order entrenched in section 41 subsection 6b do not deal with appeals to the Privy Council from any court in St. Lucia. It is therefore inconceivable as to what agreement could possibly be contemplated between St. Lucia and the United Kingdom regarding appeals from the High Court to the Court of Appeal, which is what section 107 concerns as I tried to explain earlier which would somehow concern appeals from any court in St. Lucia to the Privy Council. The reference to section 107 in 417A, in my view, makes no sense whatsoever and leads to an absurdity in construing this provision. When last you hear a judge use such language? Judges don't use language like that. Yes, true, they talk about manifest absurdity, but that's rare. A judge is saying that a provision in the Constitution is absurd. It leads to an absurdity. Section 107 bears no rational connection to appeals to the Privy Council. And similarly, an alteration of Section 107 to give effect to an agreement between St. Lucia and the UK concerning appeals to the Privy Council from a court in St. Lucia is simply, in my view, nonsensical as Section 107 simply does not deal with such appeals. You think a judge would put a neck on a block and make a statement like that? Unless she was not absolutely convinced of what she was writing? I don't even think Justice, Chief Justice Barron would have, could have put it more eloquently <laughs> and more directly than that. I don't think so. His language is different. <laughs> The different quality of erudition. And you know, this is, this is, I want you to understand, I want the people of St. Lucia to understand what Mr. Chastney is saying, what the leader of the opposition is saying. Now you need a referendum, the constitution prescribes the referendum, so you must have referendum. And I hope I've taken them through in the simplest way that I can to explain this. And why a Chief Justice has to say this is nonsense. And you know, I know what their response is going to be, to be, to be, to be you know. Oh, uh, Chief Justice, they have to go to the Privy Council. I don't know if the Privy Council will say the same thing, but I'll come to that in a few minutes. And the court concluded that there was an error in our Constitution. And if you then, as I said, read paragraph 27, and proceeds to answer all the questions put before the court, and again, for history, I'm going to read paragraph 41 of that judgment of that decision. So, and these are the questions the court was asked to answer, Mr. Speaker. Question one, whether the reference in section 47, 41.7a of the Constitution should properly be to section 108 instead of 107. If yes, was the reference to 107 an error? Answer, yes. If the answer to question one is yes, whether the error may be judicially corrected merely upon the determination of this application or by an application of, by the Attorney General to a judge of the High Court or must the error be corrected by an alteration to the Constitution? Answer, yes. The Constitution ought to be read and construed as if section 107 and section 41, subsection 7, subsection A were deleted and section 108 substituted. There is no need for further application to the High Court, which in any event has no jurisdiction to determine the question. For an order, the power to interpret such a question having been given by Parliament to the Court of Appeal by virtue of the Act. Question 3. If the answer to question 1 is, S, is yes, whether the agreement established in the Caribbean Court of Justice signed on February 14, 2001, 
and ratified by St. Lucia on July 5th, 2002, and enacted into the laws of St. Lucia as the Caribbean Court of Justice Agreement Act number 34 of 2003, constitutes an international agreement to which St. Lucia is a party for the provisions, for the purpose of the provisions of section 41, subsection 7, subsection B. The answer is yes. If the answer to questions 1 and 2 is yes, whether for the purpose of an alteration of the Constitution to replace appeals to Her Majesty in Council with appeals to the Caribbean Court of Justice, the agreement between St. Lucia and the United Kingdom referenced in Section 41, Subsection 7A, may validly be entered into by St. Lucia alone or in common or more other, than, more other states of the organization of East Caribbean state, which may have similar constitutional provisions, may validly be entered in, into prior to the passage of the bill referred to in subsection 41.2. Yes, such an agreement must predate the presentation of the bill to alter the constitution to give effect to the agreement. And here we have it. That was the process. That is the logic, that is the explanation why we need no referendum because our constitution did not contemplate any referendum. But there are other important issues. And the member for Castries East was heavy on the point of access. And I too want to say a few words about this. You know, we can talk all we want about justice, about the rule and of law and what the value of justice is. But you know, unless citizens enjoy the protection of the law, which of course translates into unimpeded access to the courts, it can never be just or right. It, it, they can never ever get the full benefit, the fruits of justice. They will not get it. Access to the courts become critical. And the point is clear. This, this, this thing has continued for too long. It can never be just or right that access to justice is only for those who can afford it. It can be right. That's why I will quarrel when my court seems you for the clause for months. It can't be right. It cannot be because access to justice is critical. And in our judicial system, there are three tiers. We have a magistrate court, and if you prefer a high court, Although the High Court has different jurisdiction, the Magistrates Court, the Court of Appeal and the Privy Council. When you go to the Magistrates Court, you're entitled, of course, to appeal your whatever, um, whatever decision against you. Go to the Court of Appeal if you want. When you go to the High Court, you're entitled to appeal from the High Court to the Court of Appeal. But then, of course, from the Court of Appeal, then you're entitled to appeal to the Privy Council. And the member of Castries East is right. We have thousands of cases being filed every day in this country. How many of these cases wind their way to the Privy Council? In the last 20 years, as he rightly said, we have roughly had 17 appeals in 20 years. And you mean to tell me that they're not ordinary St. Lucians who want their cases heard a third time by a third court to determine whether their issue was dealt with fairly and justly at the Court of Appeal or the High Court? But you know what? What? They can't get there. They can't get there. You see, you really believe that you think they don't have no right to appeal to the Privy Council? They have no reason to appeal to the Privy Council? Like a member for Castro disease, the issue has always been cost. And it's no joke. It's no joke. Mercifully these days, mercifully these days, we can follow deliberations by Zoom, as I'll tell you in a few minutes. And look at some of the costs to file for an interlocutory matter. In other words, a matter to interpret the rules as to whether you follow your, the, form, the proper procedure, to put it simply. In the UK, it's 700 pounds. And you're talking of almost three, $3,000. If you're filing an appeal that involves um, damages, monetary damages, no, you have to find about 5,200 pounds. Immediately. And if you're going to have, if you're going to engage an English solicitor or barrister or whatever to go before the Privy Council for an hour or two just in a matter 
to six leaves, for example, if it's not paper leaf, know that you have to find 2,500 pounds. Which poor person in St. Lucia can find 2,500 pounds? Now, don't come and tell me that in the case of criminal cases, they get appeals done freely because I've told you why that is done in the UK. A lot of that is done in the UK. Not because maybe there are decent lawyers in the UK that believe in human rights, but also because it fulfills and sustains the agenda of the Privy Council to abolish hanging in these islands. So they are busy making sure that those who commit criminal offenses for one reason or another are properly represented. And you can't persuade me otherwise, you know. Now, but talk to St. Lucian lawyers who have gone to the Privy Council and they'll tell you the kind of money their clients have had to pay. Talk to St. Lucians who have had recent cases before the Privy Council and ask them how much they have had to foot for the bills. And you know the system in the UK is divided between solicitors and barristers. Solicitors, of course, are the ones who do the initial legwork, the administrative arrangement and so on, and um, brief the barristers, etc. The barristers do the actual argument. Mercifully, we're not like that in St. Lucia. Our lawyers do both the work of solicitors and barristers, although you have to be careful what hat you wear when. The solicitors' fees in the UK for filing and, and um, engaging in the administrative management of a matter will cost you between $65,000 to $75,000. Appearances by barristers are upwards of $100,000. So, Mr. Speaker, what you put your light on for? Who? In St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, would be able to pay for this kind of money. Pay this kind of money. Now contrast this, Mr. Speaker, with costs at the Caribbean Court of Justice. Filing fees are divided into two categories, namely applications for what we call special leave. If you have problems getting leave, if leave is refused by your own court, or LPs as a right. An appeal for special leave to the CCJ will cost you US dollars 250. For civil cases, and I like that, that consumes less than a thousand pages. If you're going to file a case and you're going to file a thousand pages, the filing fee is US $250, Mr. Speaker. For a civil appeal that consumes more than a thousand, but less than 2,000 pages, the filing fee is US dollars 750. For a civil appeal that consumes more than 2,000 pages, the filing fee payable is US 1,200. In effect, no litigant will ever pay more than US dollars 1,200 if special leave was necessary, and US $250 if special leave was necessary, in filing fees at the CCJ. This is irrespective of the amount of money involved in the litigation. Uh, incidentally, Mr. Speaker, no fees are paid in criminal matters. And let me add, Mr. Speaker, every applicant for special leave or every appellant is entitled under the rules to apply for waiver fees. There's a rule, 1018, in the rules of procedure that allows the CCJ to completely waive all filing fees for a poor person who has an arguable ground of appeal. The rules set out the criteria for determining who is to be regarded as a poor person. That's the reality, Mr. Speaker. And I am confident that the day the CCJ is the final court of appeal, we will begin to see a rush to seek judgment by St. Lucians in a way they were never able to do under the Privy Council. And you are trying to tell me that St. Lucians don't deserve this? Don't deserve the right to find out whether the courts below have made the right decisions? And they tell you that it's a creature of politicians. And you know what is worse, most perverse? It is a UWI trained cabal that set up the court and that is in league with the court. Now I take deep offense to that. You know. I take deep offense to that. I am a UWI graduate. And I have two degrees from UWI with first class honors. And I'm as good as any student anywhere in the world. Look how you tell me that nonsense. UE is far better than many universities in Canada and the United States. Why you believe they're number five university in the hemisphere? So come in a stupid argument. And, and be feel you can contaminate me and devalue me because I have two UWI. 
I've been to university in the UK. I did the bar in the UK. I know what it takes. I did my PhD and the bar together in two years, two, three years. Oh, no nonsense, you come and tell me and try to devalue my, my degree and tell me that you are UWI cabal. And I will say this because I know Mr. Speaker, time is ebbing away. I will say this, Mr. Speaker. No community of nations in the world today has taken steps to ensure the integrity of a court that it has established than the CARICOM nation states. Why do I say that, Mr. Speaker? And don't, don't come to mention to me about the United States, you know, I come in there, you know. Don't come to me and tell me about the United States or Canada, I'm coming there, you know, or the UK, you know. You see, Mr. Speaker, let me tell you. The member of a has told you no government can hold a CCJ to ransom because we established what you call a trust fund. The government's borrowed a hundred million dollars to finance the court, and the court has been financed from the earnings of the trust fund. So no government can say, if you don't do my bidding, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to fund the court, as has happened in the region. I admit it has happened, Mr. Speaker. Their governments were guilty of that, you know, in our region. And they had to be taught a lesson. They had to be taught a lesson, Mr. Speaker. And I'll come to that in a few minutes. Secondly, the member of country speak is for the independence of the courts, the mechanism for appointing judges. The judges of Regional Judicial Legal Services Commission, no politician has access to that. Even though we may be quietly disgruntled with the decisions of the, of the Judicial and Legal Services Commission, I have seen them make choices and I disagree with their choices, but I'm not going to berate the court for that or lose confidence because of that. Nonsense! And I want you to tell them, compare and con today, as has been the case since independence in the United States, judges to the Supreme Court in the U.S. are selected by their Senate, a political body. And today in the United States, their democracy is facing pressure. Could possibly implode internally. Why? Because what they did when Trump was president was to load the court, load the court with their political appointees. And the Americans are now beginning to feel the bite of it. That door exists in the Caribbean. And when I tell you we sell our country short, it is things like that that I remember, that we don't even know and understand our inheritance, our democracy. Now look at the United Kingdom. How, when you had to tell you about the Privy Council and how the Privy Council is distant and rah, 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 rah. They did not know that until, until now, the judges of the Privy Council are the same judges in the House of Lords, and the House of Lords was the second legislative chamber in the United Kingdom that they sat in the House of Lords just like other Lords who were appointed by political parties. That's why they call them the House of Lords. What more political connection do you want from that? But you know, it was on the Blair. Now, Blair did something very interesting. Mr. Speaker, Blair did something very interesting. Blair turned around when he realized what was happening. He then established a Supreme Court. And you know where he took the inspiration from? He took the inspiration from these constitutions in our region and the constitutions handed down to African countries to establish a Supreme Court to try to make it independent and change the method of appointment to judges. Don't come and tell me about um, political. The only point, the only point of interaction comes when the president of the Caribbean Court of Justice has to be appointed and the procedure is clear. The Regional Judicial Legal Services Commission, um, they invite applications, they assess the applications, and they make a recommendation because somebody has to appoint the president of the court. And to this day, every recommendation the judicial, regional judicial legal services commission has made, the governments have gone along. They have never questioned that recommendation. Really, 
The appointment by the heads of government of the president of the court is nothing more than a, um, shall we say, a little convention, more than anything else, to signal appointment. So what are you telling me about political interference? I'll tell you this. When I served as head of the department of the faculty of law, I participated in training many graduates of the University of West Indies in law. I'm very proud of what we produced. And today, I see many of them are judges in our region, different parts of the world. I'll tell you, a lot of sadness for me is that when I see them, I can't talk to them. They're my ex-students. Chief Justice Rawlings sat, former Chief Justice Rawlings sat in my class at Kayville. But I couldn't talk to him. When I see him, hi, hello. Because of the respect and of the reverence, your judge. And it is this disservice that continues. And as I close, Mr. Speaker, this argument about fixing the judiciary before going to the CCJ only needs to be stated to be rejected. Why, Mr. Speaker? Privy Council has been around all this time. What impact has the Privy Council had on the, on, on, on the quality of, of the justice in the region apart from rendering appeals? What reforms can you say you can direct to the Privy Council? All the Privy Council has done sometimes is interpret our constitution to do their ideological bidding. If you have not tackled the problems that you have in the lower judiciary, Mr. Speaker, how on earth, how on earth are you going to stay and retain the Privy Council to tackle those problems? What is the special thing about the Privy Council should be around when you're tackling your problems? It is the, our failing over the years. And we have not followed, in, in our case, the example of the former Labour government to bring changes to the judiciary, and we must. We are the ones, for goodness sake, that established a criminal jurisdiction of the High Court, along the changes that exist, the Evidence Act, etc. We are the ones who did so, and we need to continue bringing changes to the court. This business, and I come back to that, of the people in my constituency cannot get like, access because of the problem with the magistrate courts, that should not exist. We're different. Now let me conclude by saying two things, Mr. Speaker. What is this fear of the Caribbean Court of Justice and politicians? What is this fear, Mr. Speaker? You know, Mr. Speaker, I am so very proud of, 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 of the Caribbean Court of Justice and what they have accomplished so far. You see, every politician around this table should have a mortal fear of the direction that, jurisdic that the jurisdiction of the court is taken in respect of the accountability of politicians. And there are two cases that I want to mention very briefly, but I know I don't have the time to go through them with the detail that I need, Mr. Speaker. I do, Mr. Speaker? You are generous. Then I will proceed. <laughs> And bear in mind, Mr. Speaker. The door open. Yes, he allowed the door to open. <laughs> bear in mind, Mr. Speaker. The CARICOM Treaty exists to give us certain rights. We have expanded our rights as citizens of our country and as citizens of the region. Now, it is a right that we don't understand, that's not explained to us. And it isn't because I see the venerable president of the CCJ here, or the former chief justice of the OECS court, but one of the most important decisions that was ever given by the court was a decision in a case called Myrie, where a Jamaican national who had traveled to Barbados was unlawfully detained and searched at the airport in Barbados and the court said, you cannot do that under the CARICOM Treaty. You are wrong that she's entitled to the rights conferred by the treaty. It was a path-breaking decision. And since then, we have had a plethora of other cases. Our own Eddie Ventus, the St. Lucian professor at the 
at the Faculty of Law of the University at the very last hour on the even of general election was able to accede to the jurisdiction of the court. <laughs> and asked for a ruling as to whether he was a citizen entitled to be registered as a voter on the eve of election in Barbados. And the court heard him on a Sunday afternoon by an exchange, as you know, of a, through a portal. Heard him! And ordered that he be registered as as um, a person entitled to be on the voters list and to vote in Barbados. And that is it, what I'm talking about, enlarging the rights. We don't properly grasp it. But that is in respect of the treaty of rights under the CARICOM treaty. And citizens of the Caribbean are not making use of it as they should. And then, Mr. Speaker, you had a famous case, and Belize has been producing some famous cases. There's a case called Florin Marin and Jose Coy and the Attorney General of Belize, decided upon by the CCJ. And it is a judgment that concerns redress against former ministers for corrupt behavior in public office, or abuse of ministerial powers and privileges for personal benefit, which result in financial injury or loss to the state of the crown. Now you always hear, they're not interested in, in, in politicians. And in a lecture I did recently, I traced the history of the courts dealing with politicians. And in fact, I was pointing out that politicians in our region are gradually being encircled by the courts. And they don't have as much room to move like they think they did. In that case, the Attorney General of Belize filed a claim against two former ministers of the Belizean government, alleging that during their respective terms of ministerial office, they arranged the transfer of 56 acre parcels of land to a company beneficially owned or controlled by one of them. It was further alleged that the consideration paid by the purchasing company was almost $1 million below market value and that this transaction was undertaken deliberately without lawful authority and in bad faith. Let me go over the facts again, briefly. And I'm doing this so for the benefit of our people who are listening. The allegation is that two ministers arrange for 56 acres of land that belong to the government to, to be, well, they were dealing with 56 acres, to be dealing, to be uh, made available owned by a company of which they beneficially own or in fact was controlled by one of them to benefit themselves. Now, you, I'm sure you have heard echoes of that before. And the amount paid by the benefit one of them was $1 million um, dollars below the market and, and this was well below the market value. So the Attorney General claimed that there was a significant loss to the Crown in the amount of $924,056. So the Crown was denied an additional sum of money for the land. And the question was, which you need not focus on, because that was a debate between the court, was whether the Attorney General could maintain an action against two former ministers of the Belizean government for the tort of misfeasance in public office. Now, there had never been a judgment that confirmed that you can file and succeed in a tort of misfeasance in public office. Yes, you can have uh, misfeasance in public office in public law, but not in tort. And a majority of the court decided Yes, the time had come to expand the boundaries of torts to allow for the ministers to be held liable for this tort that there was nothing standing in the way of preventing this tort. Now, you know the fascinating thing about this case? The persons who made that decision of the court were very young jurists and two of the leading members of the court, Justice Saunders, and of course, the former president of the court disagreed. 
And you're telling me, you're trying to tell me it's, it's, it's a court of cowards? A court of cowards? And in that is a message for all politicians. Because rest assured that the same law that was applied in Belize also applies here. It also applies here. And the good thing is that in the Prevention of Corruption Act of the Special Prosecutor Legislation, Parliament ensured that the thought of misfeasance in public office was a ground was a ground for those politicians who may have engaged in corrupt acts. They took no chances. The second case I want to touch on, and this is one I disagree fundamentally with the judgment, concerns a matter of accountability in electoral matters. And I disagree with, with that judgment. It's a case of Roosevelt's Kerrit, Reginald Austri, and Antoine Defoe. Now, there's an old English term they call treating. And in England, in England, on English common law, treating is unlawful. In other words, treating means that if you are engaged in a political campaign, and at a campaign, a rally, you are serving people free rum, free food, you know what I mean, free beer, then according to that, you are engaged in treating and you are therefore committing an unlawful act and therefore if you, the person was elected by virtue of those activities then crap will smoke your pipe. Now, you want to tell me, you, are, you should, I mean the Prime Minister should make this case mandatory for all of you, you know why? Because come next election, crap will smoke your pipe. Be I wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> crap will smoke your pipe. Because you may well find yourself engaging in treating. Now, what had happened in this case? For me, it was an astonishing judgment. The Court of Appeal, the High Court, I think it was, held that it had jurisdiction to consider the charge of treating before it against Roosevelt and his team of ministers. It went to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal, I think, ruled against the High Court judge and said, no, no, no. If there's an allegation of treating, because it touches on the issue of the membership of the offender in Parliament, then in that case, it's a constitutional matter and a constitutional claim should have been brought. The CCJ reversed the High the Court of Appeal. The CCJ said the magistrate is right because the magistrate was conferred with that jurisdiction. And the magistrate was right to hear the charges and determine the charges, even if the question of membership becomes a secondary question. Could you imagine Placing elected members accused perhaps of treating at the mercy of a magistrate who is at the lower rung of the judicial ladder on such a significant matter. And yet, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I don't have the time, and yet the Caribbean Court of Justice said, yes, a magistrate can make that decision and should make that decision. And you know, the intriguing thing was that accessing the magistrate, um, the jurisdiction of the magistrate was a very simple thing because, you know, accessing magistrates was relatively simple. And what is my message to you? One, my message to you is that the Caribbean Court of Justice is a fairless institution. It has never been afraid to rule against politicians. It has, um, it has um, delivered some of, of the most painful decisions that affect politicians, for which politicians will have to be on their guard, <coughs> and perhaps doing things that no other, no other court could do. Now, I disagree with the judgment in that Dominican case. I think they were wrong. But is that reason for me to lose faith and confidence in the court? 
Mr. Speaker, the answer is no. And I'm always reminded of, of, of religious individuals and churches and so on. When pastors sin, whether it is in a Catholic church or in the Anglican church, and they commit all manner of sin, and then engage in all kind of infidelity and dishonorable acts, <coughs> should I lose confidence in praying to our God or going to church because of their human errors and human mistakes? No. I would still go to church. I'll really tell you I don't go to church. <laughs> I don't know where they get those things from, but be that as it means. So, I disagree, but that doesn't mean that I should lose faith. I agree with the Court of Appeal ruling that really, this touched on the issue of membership that really that should have been dealt with by a constitutional motion. I agree. That's my view. And in my own writing on the issue, I have criticized the court for it. But the wider point is that they've had the courage Courage, Mr. Speaker, to rule against political elites of our region. Mr. Speaker, I want to end on this note. Mr. Speaker, an event took place yesterday that has monumental implications for the future of the laws of this country and the courts of this country. I am aware that the matter I was touch on is sub judice, but I'm not in the business of making any pronouncements regarding the outcome, what I think about the arguments, and so on. I'm not going to do that. That's not what I'm about, Mr. Speaker. So you don't need to invoke the standing order to strike me down. Mr. Speaker, it's an issue that was before the court. And I'm talking about the case that involves two members of this chamber, the leader of the opposition and the member for Castle South. An issue before the court was whether an article in our civil code which allowed for the importation of English law meant that in those areas where references were made, whether the law, the term law for the time being meant that the meaning was ambulatory such that it referred not to the law that existed in 1957 when the amendments were made, but to all English laws after 1957. Put succinctly, Mr. Speaker. The question was whether a defamation act enacted by the United Kingdom in 2013 was by virtue of that provision the law of St. Lucia in 2023. Now if the Privy Council agrees with the Court of Appeal this would lead to the most dramatic and revolutionary interpretation of the laws of this country and what it would mean is that in those subject areas be it defamation or quasi contracts or otherwise that if we want to find out what the law of St. Lucia is we have to go to England to find out what the English did know what their laws are and apply it down here what they call mutatis mutandis if the argument is right what does this have to do with all of this? I am not saying that a CCJ would have cured this. That's not my point. I'm far from it, Mr. Speaker. But you know what? The chickens are coming home to roost. It is our obdurate refusal to tackle our inheritance that's a problem. Everybody, I wrote about this matter extensively. I know former Chief Justice Barron is aware of it. It has found itself in his judgments. And we should have dealt with that a long time ago. But we did not. We did not. Because for some of us it pleased us that somehow we allowed for the importation of English law to govern our business. 44 years after independence, you want to tell me that if St. Lucians want to find out what the law is, 
They have to go to the English Parliament, find out what the English Parliament enacted, find out which provisions apply to them. And you want to tell me I must accept, Mr. Speaker, the retention of the Privy Council, I must accept that inheritance? No, tell me that, Mr. Speaker. That's what the problem is. We don't want to look at our inheritance because we believe all things handed down from the imperial throne was good and right and proper, that it protected us not knowing, not knowing that we're injuring ourselves, our legacy, our reputation, our thinking, our being, who we are and what we are. No matter what decision the Privy Council comes to, there's no question that this provision in our civil code will have to be reviewed. And the Attorney General better start to work on it now. How could St. Lucia, 44 years after independence, tell me that its laws can only be understood if we know what the English Parliament has enacted? You think when they sit in the House of Commons passing their laws, they remotely remember that a little country like St. Lucia is interested in our laws or they'll have to follow their laws? You think they care hoots about St. Lucia? They will snide and make their snide remarks? You think they care? What are we saying about ourselves? And so, Mr. Speaker, on an end on this note, this constitutional amendment is about us. It is about ourselves. It is about our future. It is about our honor. It is about integrity. It is about the fact that we understand we are as good as any anywhere in the world. And we must never ever make the mistake of continuing to short, short change ourselves by believing that others are better than us. Our judges are as good as any, anywhere. Anywhere in the world. That is why today they are the pinnacles, the pinnacles dispensing justice all over the world. And yes, I have problems with judges. Yes, I have problems with court decisions. But that doesn't mean that because there are problems that there are issues that we should dispense with what is rightfully ours and that we don't recognize the quality and brilliance of what we have? Mr. Speaker, I asked the people of St. Lucia to give me the opportunity to speak to them. I have been robust, I admit. I have been very robust in what I've said today. And I hope I have said it in a way that they can understand me and why over the years I have championed the Caribbean Court of Justice, why I have been at the forefront of the Caribbean Court of Justice. And I said in this house before, under no circumstances would I betray what I have believed in and what I have said. I've said so before. And there are times that some of you here are uncomfortable when I say that. But you don't have to be uncomfortable because I want to be faithful to what I preached. And if I sat and at CARICOM and participated and guided the drafting of that agreement, signed it in 2014, commenced the process, that has taken us this far, not being completed by, by my successor. You expect me to come to this house repudiated on this fanciful notion of a referendum that is so unnecessary? I can't do that, Mr. Speaker. Neither my training, my conscience, or my philosophy allows me to do so. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your tolerance and understanding. Thank you.